Hi, Charles says the Book Sage here. This is my Mandalorian Season 3, Episode 3, Chapter 19 review of The Convert. This was a very odd episode. We had an opening and closing scene with uh, Din Djarin, Grogu, and bo But the whole bulk of the episode itself, we were following um, Dr. Pershing. We saw a few times in Seasons 1 and 2. He was the scientist that Moff Gideon had working on cloning. It was such a stark like change of pace from the opening scene with Din Djarin and Bo-Katan to this. It felt like we were suddenly left the Mandalorian show and were dropped in an episode of Andor because it was very much like a like one of those Andor episodes, except where in that show we were seeing like the bureaucracy of the Empire and all these Imperial departments and things. In this episode, we're seeing the bureaucracy of the New Republic. Dr. Pershing seems to be part of a group of former personnel from the Empire that the New Republic has sort of repatriated. They've sent them through this sort of rehabilitation program, and now they're these sort of um, amnesty people. And they've been given, like, amnesty, like, numbers. And they refer to each other as this sort of, like, amnesty officer G-58. Dr. Pershing is amnesty scientist L-52. A bit kind of uncomfortable (laughs) with this sort of stripping away and dehumanizing them by giving them these, like, code numbers that they have to be referred to as. They have to, I think, earn their way to be trusted and then eventually to be actual, maybe down the road, become citizens of the New Republic. You know, didn't go into all the fine details of what that whole process is, other than there's a rehabilitation center. You go through all of that, and he's put in this amnesty housing complex on Coruscant. So most of the episode takes place on Coruscant. So it was pretty cool. You know, it's always fun to see that sort of former capital of everything, even though I guess it's still the capital of the New Republic at this point. We're just following Dr. Pershing. His whole section of this episode starts off with him giving a speech to all these, what looks like a lot of high upper class, high class sort of dignitaries of Coruscant. And he's talking about the cloning work that he was doing and what he had hoped for and that unfortunately it was something the Empire had their hands on and might have had nefarious reasons for, but that he hopes that it's something the New Republic will be kind of open to because there's a lot of medical possibilities. All these sort of dignitaries are like coming up and saying hello and so good to you, have you here now, just all that schmarmy, like fake stuff. But then he's in a sort of taxi (laughs) and driven back to the amnesty apartment complex where we meet some other former um, imperial people and the surprise here this episode is there is the woman who was on Moff Gideon's uh, bridge crew I assumed she was like the commanding officer on the bridge but she presents herself here later in the episode that she was a communications officer and she's a member of this whole repatriated group of former imperial people and she's living in this housing complex as well she sort of befriends Pershing and they're just discussing, talking. The group is sort of like, what do you miss from the day, old days? Not about the empire itself, but like some mundane day-to-day thing. And, and for Pershing, it's sort of these like yellow ration crackers or something. But the bulk of the episode, like I said, is just Pershing doing his sort of mundane job. He's cataloging all this old data, a lot of it old imperial data <laughs> as well that Coruscant still had lying around. And he's starting to notice that there's actually really important things and good things in here that just because it's something the Empire was also using doesn't mean it should be destroyed and it's marked for destruction. So you could see Pershing kind of being torn. He's trying to be a good, you know, repatriated amnesty officer, amnesty scientist, doing whatever work they give him. The scientist part of him is struggling because... He's just watching important knowledge that could help society just being flagged uh, destroy this, destroy this, destroy this, just because it was something that the Empire was also doing. And we learn later, they don't really get rid of all of the Imperial stuff. They just take some of it and give it a nice sounding name, but still use it. We'll get to that in a minute. The former bridge commander that was with Moff Gideon, she starts kind of working Uh, on Pershing and she tells him it's like well what if you could do some of that important science like study you were doing before 
What if you were able to do that here? And even though he's the Republic won't let him, she tells him that she knows where he could get his hands on some sort of mobile lab equipment. And after a few days, he finally breaks down and agrees. Okay, let's do it. So she sneaks him off the sort of amnesty apartment complex, and they get on some transport, like basically Coruscant's version of a subway. <laughs> and they manage to go all the way out to this scrapyard where there's all this, like there's an Imperial, what looks like a cruiser or something, like scrapped there, and it's being eventually just broken down and dismantled and discarded. She knows that there's got to be lab equipment on there. So they sneak into this ship because there's no one guarding it. It's just scrap at this point. And they hear noises and they're running because they're being chased, followed. And they run outside and then they're caught. And there's all these sort of New Republic officers suddenly surround them. A spotlight is put on them from a sort of like almost like a helicopter-esque, like a police helicopter looking thing. While they were sneaking around the like scrapped cruiser looking for the equipment, she um, stops and basically formally introduces herself, like apologizing. I never once said hello to you. Well, hundreds of times we pass each other on Moff Gideon's ship. And she says, I'm Elia Kane, communications officer, and holds out her hand. And he says, Dr. Penn Pershing, you know, scientist. And they shake hands, and then they go and get the equipment. But now when they're caught outside after this, she suddenly turns and takes the case away from him and hands it to one of the New Republic officers and steps back with them. And Pershing, Dr. Pershing realizes he's been set up. And he's like he's confused and he doesn't understand what's happening or why. And then the next thing we see, he's strapped to a table <laughs> and there's like this sort of alien doctor there. And they're like disappointed in him and they're gonna slide him into this machine. She's just gonna beam some good thoughts into his head take away his um, mental trauma. It's all for good purposes and good reasons, of course. And Dr. Pershing, as he's being like slid in, he's kind of like looking to the side and he's like, no, 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 wait, this is an Imperial Mind Flayer. This is a, like a torture device. And the New Republic doctor is like, no, 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 you're mistaken. This is the 602 mitigator and it doesn't torture you at all. It just beams soothing rays into you to just kind of ease that trauma. Nothing to worry about. Nothing like the Imperial um, Mind Warper or anything like that. And he's like, no, this is an Imperial Mind Warper. I know what this is. And he slides and he sees Elia, the former communications officer for Moff Gideon, uh, in the other room watching through the display glass, watching from the observation room. And he's just trying to ask her, like, why did you betray me? Why did you set me up? And then we switch to inside the room and she's having a conversation with the man working the machine. And she just asks, is, is it all right if I stay? Because even though he's turned out to be bad, he's still a friend and I still feel bad for him. Can I just, I just want to stay. And so the guy's like, fine, that's fine. And he leaves and leaves her alone. And he had just turned the machine up to like three to kind of, so it's not a torture device. And it, I mean, it's not great because it is sort of conditioning your mind. And she just kind of looking at him and then reaches over and she just cranks that thing all the way up. The scene ends there with her like taking a bite out of the yellow biscuits that she had kind of gotten for him after he said he missed those to kind of gain his trust. And then we're back to suddenly to Bo-Katan, Grogu, and Din Djarin. And just boom, we're flung back into a Mandalorian episode again. And again, it's just oh, just such a harsh like change of scene. It's really, really strange. It's almost like in the book of Boba Fett, you know, there was like those two episodes that suddenly we were taken out of the Boba Fett show and dropped back into a Mandalorian show. And in this episode here, like I said, it's like we're taken out of the Mandalorian show and we're dropped into an episode of Andor, but New Republic style. Really just strange transition because no warning, no, no sort of bridge scene, anything. It's just boom. We're here, and then boom, we're, we're there, and then boom, we're back here again with totally different moods, totally different pacing, everything. It's just really, really bizarre. Like I mentioned at the start of this review, the opening and closing of the episodes dealt with Din Djarin, Grogu, and Bo-Katan. I'm just going to cover those real quick. The episode picks up pretty much right where we left off at the end of the previous episode. 
they're down right by the living waters. Mando is, Din is, I keep calling him Mando. <laughs> Din is woken up and he's okay and they're ready to kind of come back, back up out of the caves and get out of there. And Boa Katan asks him if, did he see anything? Just, just, she's kind of feel him out to see if he saw the mythosaur and he didn't really see anything. And she doesn't tell him about it. Anyway, they go back up to the surface. Just her ship is there because Grogu had taken Mando's Naboo ship to Kalavala to go get her. And Bo-Katan and Grogu came back in her ship only. So they all pile into her ship and they take off. They head out into space. And it's interesting because Bo and Din are talking briefly. And then Grogu starts babbling. And then they look back at him. And then all of a sudden the warning goes off and there's TIE, tie interceptors like shooting at them. It almost looks like Grogu kind of felt them coming, but can't really articulate speech properly yet to have legitimately warned them. But it does seem like he kind of felt it and he was trying to say something. So anyway, they're getting chased. These TIE interceptors have come out of nowhere. Mando Din <laughs> is in the back trying to shoot at them and He's not really good at that. Not that very, very skilled. Not in her ship anyway. He's never used this equipment before, as far as I'm aware. They race back to um, Kalevala, her planet, where Bo's castle and her family was raised and everything. These TIE interceptors follow them down and they're fighting. Din realizes he's got to get to his Naboo ship to help her. Because if there's two of them, you know, they'll have a much better chance against these TIE interceptors. Bo just basically skydives the ship to low enough so above the landing area by her castle so din can just basically jump out and he free falls most of the way down and then turns on his jetpack so that he doesn't like smash <laughs> and manages to have a decent landing gets in his nobu ship nobu ship and takes off right before it's blown up um, Bo has led all the tie interceptors away and she's kind of zooming through with her Mandalorian ship through these cliffs. It's almost like, like a ocean cliff version of like what you would see on Tatooine with Beggar's Canyon. And she's like kind of leading him on a chase, and she knows these cliffs pretty well, but she hasn't done this in a long time. Anyway, you got the, you got the exciting kind of fight scene, and between Din and his ship and her and her ship, they pretty much take care of these few TIE interceptors who were chasing them. But then all of a sudden they hear bombing in the distance and they see smoke coming up. And they race up in their ships and then they see the TIE bombers are just bombing um, her castle like pretty much into oblivion, into rubble. And then take off. And then she just right after them and Din is trying to follow. And all of a sudden this whole massive, like multiple squadrons of TIE ships suddenly show up. And... They need to hightail it the hell out of there. So they managed to turn and go and get up out of out of orbit and into space, being chased by a massive amount of TIE, tie ships. No indication of where they showed up from, where they came from, because I was expecting to maybe see like a Imperial cruiser or something, that there's nothing there. So we don't know who really sent them. And then he beams her coordinates. They make the jump to hyperspace in both of their ships. And then that's how the opening scene ends. And then it's that whole Coruscant stuff. But then after Dr. Pershing is set up and he's being basically, his mind is being zapped, we come back to Din and Bo and Grogu arriving at the planet, wherever this Mandalorian convert is, the cave that we saw in episode one. And they arrive, they land there. Some of the Mandalorian, the watch, come out to meet them, Paz Vizsla in particular, and Mando says that, you know, hey, I've been to the waters. And no, no one believes them, of course. And no one believes um, Bo that she witnessed it. But they agree to take her into the armorer. So they go in to see the armorer. And Din presents her like this sort of flask that has some of the living water in it. And she pours it into one of her little sort of pools there that she uses in her smelting and stuff. And then she, it kind of spreads out. And she sees that it is indeed some of the living waters from the mines of Mandalore. And then she welcomes Din back, saying he's redeemed himself, he's back into the watch. And um, then she turns to bo Tan and tells her, you know, you're welcome, you know, you're welcome as well. And Bo's like, 
I don't follow the old ways. This is not my thing, pretty much. But the armor is like, did you go into the water, living waters? And Bo's like, I did. And she's like, have you taken your helmet off since you came out of them? And Bo realizes, no, I haven't, actually. So then the armor says, well, then you're one of us. You're welcome to stay. If you want to leave, you're welcome to leave whenever you want. But be welcome here among us. You're now We now consider you a member of the Watch, which is really interesting because, you know, Bo's ancestral home just got bombed into oblivion. So she doesn't really have anywhere else to go, which kind of super convenient plot wise. Yes. You know, those things happen where she doesn't really have much of a choice. So I imagine she's probably going to stick with them for a while. Now, back in the Clone Wars days, you know, bo did kind of team up with the Watch. And she kind of became a member of the Watch under, I think it was pre Vizsla at the time. So this is, she's familiar with an earlier incarnation of this group from well, I don't know how many years prior we are at this point. Is this maybe 25? Is it 20? No. 19. This is about 19 years, I think, since Revenge of the Sith. So she's familiar with an earlier incarnation of the Watch when most of these current members were young themselves. And that's how the episode ends. I liked it. I liked both parts. As much as I did like it, it was such a stark change from the opening scene with Bo and Din and TIE fighters and fighting to all of a sudden we're on Coruscant with this entirely different story, entirely different mood, everything. It's almost like you're watching a different show. Almost like I said, like a, a New Republic version of an episode of Andor instead of an Imperial version. And then we're back to Din and Bo and Grogu and them at the end. So it's just odd, really stark shift. From this to that and then back to this again i don't know if it could have been presented in any better way i don't know if you just started the whole 30 minutes or so or 25 minutes of the chorus on stuff and just did all that and then had all the din and bow stuff at the end i don't know but they just they bookended this whole chorus on thing with two um like mandalorian scenes it was just really odd and really disjointed it looks like the former Imperial communications officer of Moff Gideon's is going to kind of become another character who we're going to follow as a subplot in this season. Now, there's nothing to indicate that this is what she's doing, but my guess is she's working for Moff Gideon still. Like, she's agreed to kind of go undercover to present herself to the New Republic, go through repatriation, become a amnesty officer and just do the work do what's expected um basically study who she can manipulate to begin to rise herself up at least starting now in the amnesty ranks i'm assuming she's going to try to get to some sort of like new republic classification status so she can get at some particular critical information this is my guess is she's there following Moff Gideon orders. She's obviously there for a reason. She's obviously doing something. I'm just going to, for now, assume until I see otherwise that she's still working for Imperial people, that she's still working for Moff Gideon. But we'll see. We'll see where that goes. I do remember, um, like, there was a lot of chatter during season two. People were wondering, is that Sabine on, you know, undercover, infiltrating Imperial people? You know, is that Sabine? People were convinced that that was Sabine from Rebels, but obviously not. At this point, I think this episode has put to bed any chance of that actually having been Sabine undercover. It'll be interesting to see where this goes, but if we're going to get more like Coruscant, like amnesty officer kind of bureaucracy stuff, it's hopefully they find a better way to kind of shift between the Mandalorian things and the Coruscant things, because it just came out of left field in this episode. And we'll see. Maybe now that we've had this, it won't be so jarring if we get more of this going forward, where we get these kind of side-by-side storylines that have very different feels to each other that you assume will eventually collide at some point. I don't know how to give this show any kind of grading, whether it's a one through five. 
maybe I'll come up with a grading system at some point doing doing these reviews, and then I'll kind of do a grading of each of the episodes up to whatever video I'm at at that point. So I don't really know how to feel about this episode, though. Like I said, I liked both parts, but they were just so completely different from each other. It, they just felt out of place in the same episode. That could just be a me thing. Uh, let me know what you thought of this episode. Did you find it very jarring as well to suddenly be thrown into what felt like an entirely different show for most of this episode? Or was that transition perfectly fine for you? And where do you think this kind of Coruscant stuff, particularly with this former like Moff Gideon officer, where do you think that's going? Do you think she's really working for Moff Gideon still? We haven't seen hide nor hair of him uh, this season, so... Last we saw, he was, you know, he was a prisoner of the New Republic. But there seems to be all these rumors flying around among uh, former Imperial people living in this amnesty community about what has actually happened to him. Because it seems to be like conflicting tales being told. So we don't know if he's still in custody somewhere or if someone like broke him out. Or for all we know, that's what she's doing there. She's working her way through the amnesty ranks, perhaps, to get access to Moff Gideon to get him out of there. We'll see. We'll see where this goes, because I can't imagine Moff Gideon's not going to make another appearance in this show. That is my Season 3, Episode 3, Chapter 19, The Convert Review. If you haven't seen my thoughts on the first and second seasons, you can click on this playlist here, which will include Episodes 1, 2, and this episode as well.